So what is the difference between these two girls? You might be thinking their age, their hair color, or maybe even their clothes they're wearing. But there's something fundamentally different about them. The first one is 15. She lives in Washington, D.C., and when she went missing, the media referred to her as a girl. The second one is Jennifer Arouse. She's one of Jeffrey Epstein's victims, and the media refers to her as an underage woman, even though she's a minor. This fallacy about girls being seen as underage women first came to my attention in an article in The Atlantic written by Megan Garber. And that is what I want to focus on today. How media and pop culture have failed women by portraying them and objectifying them, even though they might be underage. So historically, the narrative about vulnerable and abused young girls has been centered around the perspective of a man rather than the perspective of a woman. Take, for instance, the 1999 film American Beauty in which Kevin Spacey, the protagonist, basically falls in love with his teenage daughter's friend. He begins having visions about her, laying naked on rose pills, completely sexualizing her. The problem here is not the story itself. The director can choose to tell any story he wants. Instead, it's how the director portrays the girl as a mature woman with the same complexity and sexual desires that one would normally have. And you might be thinking this is harmless. You might be thinking, I know that's a girl in that movie. But did you really? Even I have to admit I'm guilty of mislabeling young girls as women. I remember that when I read Nabokov's Lolita, that at the end of the novel, the point where she's both pregnant and married, thinking she was 22. I mean, how could she be both pregnant and married at an age under 22? Just to finish the book and close it and realize that in actuality, she was 17. These acts are not meaningless. These acts are not constrained by the limits of a book or the movie. So it is time to ask, what if these acts of microaggression continue? What if schools keep on enforcing dress codes that discriminate against women, even though they're not intended to? What if Hollywood movies keep romanticizing the relationship between a middle-aged man and a girl, not an underage woman, a girl? So, to start up on the right foot, I would like to define microaggression so that everybody here understands it under the same context. Microaggression, as defined by American psychologist Daryl Wing Sue, is basically any small comment or question that's set up in a casual context. The person saying it does not mean to hurt the recipient, but the comment reinforces some common stereotype that ends up hurting the person. So, this acts of microaggression lead to something called aversive discrimination. Aversive discrimination is when the person themselves does not believe in discrimination, but then there's like subconsciously some things that point to discrimination. So take this study performed by Jack Dovio from Yale University. He tasked a white man to choose between two applicants, a white applicant and a black applicant. When both applicants had the same qualifications, as you might expect, 50% of the time, the person chose the black applicant, and 50% of the time, she chose the white applicant. However, as soon as those qualifications became ambiguous, or the black and the white person had no qualifications, the white man usually went with the white applicant. So even though he's not intending to be discriminatory, he was. And it's not only that it's perpetrating incorrect ideas in society. It also perpetrates ideas for the person taking it. It hurts the person who those comments are directed to. Another study put Asian women to take a math test. Half of the women were reminded of the stereotype that Asians are better than math than the rest of the population. The other half were reminded of the stereotype that men are better at math than women. Who do you think performed better on the test? Just take a look at this graph in which black and white people were tasked with taking a test. When the terms intelligence diagnostic were used, blacks performed significantly worse than white test takers because of the stereotype that blacks are less intelligent than whites. So now that we've established with these examples the problem with microaggression, let's move on to focus back on girls. As you might expect, the most common acts of microaggression that girls face have to do with their bodies. Comments like, you're gonna have to fight the boy love with a stick, they assume that the girl's body is her only asset, and then they also help her gradually internalize that idea. 
Moreover, the more voluptuous a girl is, the more often these comments go her way. So it just hurts the girl more and more and more. So now let's look at a different scenario in which it's the clothes they're wearing, how they choose to portray their bodies, that's criticized. When an adult tells a 14-year-old girl, you are showing too much skin, he's assuming that the reason she's wearing that clothes is to seduce somebody instead of because she's proud of her own body, because she wants to wear that. And it's the jump to this conclusion that creates microaggression and reinforces the stereotype that girls are the ones wrong, that girls are the ones that are incorrectly portraying their body. And then here's the ironic part. Society then goes ahead and complains, oh, but why do you only focus on your body? Or why are you so set on your image? Well, so I think that Cruz once wrote that why are you complaining about not seeing when you're the one tarnishing the mirror? Society, with its colloquial remarks, is reiterating this idea that women and girls should focus on their bodies. So now I want to talk about why this is important to me. And as many of you in the audience know, ASF administrative team recently enforced the dress code. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, the dress code, the idea was to set up coherence between what is done at school and what is worn at school. But sadly, it falls under the category of microaggression. And let me tell you why. Just to take a quote from the handbook itself, it mentions that young girls, well, not young girls, sorry, clothing should not be overly or distract from the learning environment by showing the student's physique. So, as you can imagine, what this excerpt is suggesting is that when girls are wearing clothing that points to their own body, they're distracting guys. And this is what I'm referring to. Why should guys be distracted when in reality it's the girls that want to portray their body? And then the school goes ahead and says, you're right, they are distracting, that's why they shouldn't be wearing the attire. So it doesn't make sense. And the most ironic part is that Jeanette de Montaire is a journalist, even says it herself that microaggression detracts from education more than the clothing somebody's wearing. And before anyone says it, I am aware that men, this clause also applies to men, but a, a simple look at the fashion industry nowadays reveals who this clause is meant to affect. So now, if there were some way to have a dress code that used different language or to remove the dress code, girls wouldn't feel this pressure on their bodies and would not assume that the body is the only asset. Instead, boys would have no document backing up their stance about, yes, they are distracting. So that's why I'm standing here today. I want to raise awareness about microaggression because it is a form of violence. It is passive and it is aggressive, even though it might not seem so. And I want to live in a girl world where a girl is not afraid to wear a crop top to school. Thank you.